This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Well, hey, everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you're tuned into When Science Speaks. Thanks so much for being here. Today's episode is brought to you by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists and engineers get funding, gain influence, and build relationships with the stakeholders who matter most. It is such a great pleasure to have Dr. Aaron Sullivan on the show today. Aaron is an associate professor of healthcare management at the Sawyer School of Business at Suffolk University and holds a part-time faculty appointment in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine Center for Primary Care at Harvard Medical School. Aaron joined Suffolk University in July 2020 after spending seven years as the Research and Curriculum Director at the Harvard Medical School Center for Primary Care. In that role, she worked across an array of research and evaluation projects related to primary care. However, her flagship research project was mixed methods case study research to understand exemplary primary care. Erin's research and teaching interests are focused on how to build leaders, teams, and culture in healthcare. She's conducted research related to healthcare delivery in over 10 countries and on three continents. Erin earned a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from Wellesley College and a PhD in Business Studies from Trinity wow. College, Dublin. Welcome to the show, Erin. Thank you so much for being here. Mark, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. So many interesting things to talk about. Um, let's start with Suffolk, where you're at right now at Suffolk, uh, wow. Suffolk Sawyer School of Business, because you're doing research on leaders and high-performing teams, which is just a fascinating, fascinating topic, which so many people are interested in. And I'd love for you to share with listeners how your research is going and what you can tell us about your latest work. Sure. So I so much research going on. Um, COVID's been an interesting time to to do research, actually. Um, and some of my research is on COVID. One of the one of the projects is um, the impact of COVID nineteen on primary care and what's happened in primary care delivery because of COVID. Um, you know, there's been, as everyone knows, there's been a um, rapid adoption of telehealth in the last Mm -hmm. year. Um, And that has led to a lot of change in how care is delivered. And I think one of the really interesting questions is how are we going to accommodate this hybrid um, in-person and virtual visit uh, in the future for primary care and and for many other, um, you know, healthcare specialties as well. What is, what does the future look like and what does that mean for the workforce? Um, A lot of what had happened in primary care and what I had worked with Uh, and studied at the Center for Primary Care about primary care had to do with a shift to patient-centered medical homes um, Mm -hmm. in the last 10 years or so and and building stronger primary care teams uh, within primary care practices Mm -hmm. so that clinicians and doctors didn't have to do everything themselves, right? There's so much to do in primary care between urgent visits, preventative care, chronic care, that a lot of the data around, if you were just a solo doctor, doing primary care every day and everything you need to do when you see patients, you'd be working 21 hours a day. Um, And so teams have been built and were built over time to help support the role of the primary care physician and have other people, um, you know, have nurses, for example, helping with patient education Mm -hmm. and chronic care management, um, figure out how to bring social workers into your team to help deal with mental and behavioral health issues. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had worked really hard in primary care to, to move to team model and to make primary care team sport. And then all of a sudden everything got interrupted because of COVID. And um, it's been really interesting to talk to uh, primary care physicians and teams and see what are things looking like now and what are the struggles and what are the pain points and what's the workforce going to look like moving forward? Do you, do you actually need a medical assistant to room people um, in a physical clinic? Um, Or do you need someone who can room people in a clinic and also help tech, you know, do some technology troubleshooting Mm -hmm. um, for people who are trying to get on telehealth? Um, 
what what is the team of the future? What is the the virtual visit and the in person combination in the future? And how do you staff that? Mm-hmm. Um, because everything's been disrupted. Wow. I mean, the whole like you were saying, the whole model of what you what is exemplary care, totally changing. That is just really, really interesting to me. You know, just as an aside, when I worked on Capitol Hill, I did a lot of work on a provision that we were successful in getting into the Affordable Care Act, which related to delivering um, primary care in the home for Mm -hmm. chronically ill patients. And it was this cross-functional team and the nurse practitioner and the docs and, you know, being able to put an x-ray sort of machine in the back of a Prius because technology had miniaturized the ability to do that. And yeah, yeah, it uh, it was wonderful allowing people to stay in their home and not have to go into the nursing home because um, they could get primary care at home. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the the physicians I've talked to about what's the benefit of telehealth is, you know, they feel like they can do a virtual home visit. They're able to observe and collect data and see things and meet dogs and children mm-hmm. that they just hear about, you know, in an office visit when they're actually, you know, on whatever the telehealth app is talking to someone in the home. So there's, there is this whole like virtual home visit and and what can you do remotely? Um, that's also going to impact how do we deliver care? How do we build the right team for care? What, what does primary care look like going forward? So there's been um, just a lot of, of work that I've been doing around that question in particular. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And getting to that point, And again, things are really changing quickly, but maybe at a high enough level that it's really still relevant regardless of what, what kind of models we end up with in the future, but what elements do you find are uh, that really need to be active, that really need to be implemented to provide exemplary primary care to patients? Oh, there's so many. Um, I think, you know, payment is a whole issue and we have to pay for primary care differently. And a lot of people who are more expert on that than I am talk about it and write about it. But I think, um, one of the things that I look at about exemplary primary care and primary care in the wake of COVID is we have to stop paying for primary care in a visit base. Like you go to the office, you see a doctor, they, and you know, and then you pay your copay and your insurance pays mm-hmm. for the visit. We have to stop paying for primary care like that because what telehealth has opened up is you can see your doctor in a televisit. There's a lot of asynchronous email communication going on. There's telephone communication going on. There's five to 10 minute visits instead of the standard 15 or 30, depending on um, you know what your particular needs are that are happening. And we've been able to be more flexible with how we're engaging with our primary care physicians. And because of that, we have to just be able to pay them in a way that they can take care of you using whatever modality works on any given day for you and what your presenting issue is, and they get paid and we have to get out of the visit model. So I think that's a big, big thing on the the payment and policy side, but um, my work and a lot of my research has been around um, leadership and the difference leadership makes. And I think leadership and organizational culture. I think we've seen it um, in in the wake of, of COVID-19. You know, it's been in the news. There are people talking to me about leadership and the importance of leadership in, in healthcare and in primary care that, you know, didn't pay a lot of attention when I was, you know, speaking before or talking about primary care before and how important it is to have leaders and frontline mm-hmm. leaders that have realized, you know, in a crisis how important leadership is. And I think, I think that leadership element um, and strong leadership and having physicians in leadership roles is really important and building a culture, um, a a culture that's right for the organization and right for care delivery. And that's, you know, patient centered is also really important. Mm -hmm. And one of the other sort of projects I've been working on that started pre COVID that we're just writing up has been about why do physicians lead and take on leadership roles? Um, We asked the question of, of primary care physicians across the country. Why, why have you accepted a leadership role or why have you stepped into a leadership Mm -hmm. role or why, when you were voluntold to take this leadership role, did you not run away? Um, And that sort of, that's another story that I'm, I'm working on telling and getting out there. Yeah, I love that. And I want to go in this direction right now, actually, by asking you, what makes an effective leader in the science and medical fields? Oh, goodness. Um, So many things, but it's a great question. You know, I think curiosity is really important. And I think, you know, when I think about scientists in particular, um, 
there is a tendency to be curious and ask questions. And I think as a leader, maintaining a level of curiosity and openness to what you hear from um, your team, your followers, mm-hmm. your organization is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the the best leaders that I, I've studied and had the privilege of working with, they never they never thought they knew all the answers, right? And they were they were always curious to hear what others thought. Um, they were trustworthy. I think trust has gotten you know a lot of airtime in the wake mm-hmm. of the pandemic mm-hmm. as well. So I think being trustworthy is really important, and then humility, right? Mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. I think there's something in knowing what you don't know and building a team and an organization around you that can get the work done. Um, So those are, those are some of the, the traits that come to mind. And, you know, I think empathy is really important as well, um, particularly in the times we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I love how you talked about curiosity. I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer in that as well. And sort of what I see as a, you know, as somebody on the outside, who's not focused on this is, you know, that kind of curiosity being a big part of your approach to science, as you noted, but then when you become a leader, for some reason, you think that you're supposed to have all the answers. And, you know, like you were, like you were highlighting, you know, the really effective leaders don't make that mistake or don't fall into that syndrome of thinking, okay, well, now that I'm, you know, leading, I have to actually know all the answers. Right, right. It's, they're sort of maintaining that stance of curiosity and questioning and openness. Um, is I think a key trait and it, it sort of, you know, helps you gather data Mm -hmm. and ideally, hopefully by being curious and being a curious leader, um, people will, will come to you with their ideas, will come to you with their challenges. There'll be, you know, room for innovation and to solve them right as a group or as a team and get to the next best place by maintaining that that element of curiosity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And you noted curiosity first, which it's, it's interesting, too, because it seems like it's almost that curiosity opens the door to these other traits that you were talking about. You know, like you just mentioned, people now, you know, coming to you as a leader to share ideas and maybe share their problem. I mean, these like then empathy can come in and, you know, these, uh, these other, um, I, you know, these other elements that you were, you were talking about. So, so important. Well, I want to ask you on a fundamental level, um, whether you think scientists should be leaders or just follow the data and, you know, what I mean by that, when I, when I think about that is this tension between, well, you know, we now maybe beyond just the medical environment, you know, we've run the experiments, we've, you know, we've gotten all this information and here's what the data looks like. We're going to present the data on the one hand. And then on the other hand, sort of being like, well, you know, how do I make sure that this information gets out and it gets out in an accurate way, but also maybe in a way that's going to persuade or influence or shape behavior, um, you know, and we could, of course, take COVID as the most maybe historic example that we've seen, uh, where all this information, you know, it, all, it has to be communicated in a way that the public understands and, and embraces, or we end up with 500,000 people in counting, right, who have right. passed away as a result. Right. Um so I think the answer to your question is actually it depends. And <laughs> I think it comes back to, you know, I don't think everyone, everyone's purpose and passion is to be a capital L leader. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there are some scientists and physician and physician scientists and, and social scientists for that matter, who love being in their data and that's okay. They mm-hmm. want to be in their data and they don't want to be the people that are persuading influence or shaping behavior that just might not be where their purpose and their passion intersect. Mm-hmm. And they need the support of the people with the skills whose passion and skill set is persuasion and influence and shaping behavior and communicating, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's where great partnerships can come in or great teams come in um, is letting people be in their natural zone or um, what Scott Snook at Harvard business school calls their sweet spot of, Mm -hmm. of, of where their their purpose and passion intersect. And for everyone, that's not going to be the capital L leader behind the podium or at the front of the room. And that needs, I think that needs to be okay. And I think that is okay. Um, And you know, I think great teams are built 
around people with complementary skill set. I mean, I think in medicine, we've seen some health systems, for example, really move to a model where there is a an MD leader and an administrative leader. So you have that person who's the clinical expert working with a person who's sort of the administrative, operational, financial person um, within a department or a division, and they're sort of co-leading because they have complementary skill sets. Um, so I think you know, part of my my answer to your question of should scientists be leaders or just follow the data is where are their skills, where are their passion, and if they don't want to be the one at you know doing all the communication, influencing, and shaping behavior, how do they partner? How do they give someone the data and help someone translate the data for mass consumption? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So great, really insightful. Um, you know, I want to ask you thinking about scientists and medical professionals who are in leadership positions. Um, what are some of the common pitfalls that you've seen that they experience, say, within their respective organizations? That's a great question. So this is interesting. And this is um, when I think about physicians, and I think scientists might be similar, because when you think about scientists and physicians, um, a lot of them train to be experts in mm-hmm. in something, right? In a field, in a subfield, in a discipline, they're trained to be experts. Um, and that's why people seek them out um, is for their expertise. And it's really, really hard to lead experts. Um, <laughs> that is a hard thing to do. And when we asked physicians in our leadership study um, about why why do you think other physicians resist or don't step up to leadership roles? What have you heard or what have you observed? It's they don't want to lead their peers. They mm-hmm. don't they don't want to lead their peers who like they actually enjoy having the camaraderie and the collaboration with them. Um, and they're they, they're leading people just like them, and that can be really hard. And people have and they express that in our in our data set. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is so true. It is difficult. People generally don't really like to be told what to do as a as a baseline. Um, and so how do you figure out a way to do this in a nuanced, more collaborative way, bringing these elements that you are talking about? Um, you know, one kind of dynamic that that you and I had a chance to talk about offline was that promotions sometimes happen because Mm. someone's good at what they do, technically good in their own technical field. So, you know, you're getting promoted uh, for that purpose. But then, of course, if you don't have kind of these elements or your passion is not leading people, then you're not going to be successful in this new kind of environment. And so it can be hard to pass up a a promotion, so to speak, to to leadership. Um, I would just love for you to share your comments and your take on that. Yeah, no, I think that's a great that's a great question because I think you're making a great observation that it it's hard to pass a promotion, right? Promotions come with titles, potentially come with more money. They might come with a, an office with a window. Mm-hmm. Um, why wouldn't you want a promotion if you're offered a promotion for your technical excellence? Um, and I think. Uh, in medicine, which is where I've spent a lot of time in my career, um, they do tend to, they have traditionally promoted people with the most research publications and research funding to mm-hmm. positions of leadership. And just because you can write a bunch of papers and get in the New England Journal, it doesn't mean that you should be leading a whole division of made up of, you know, physicians and nurses and administrators and, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, 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 those aren't the same skill set. Right. Um, but that has tended to be what happens. And that's, that's like the, that's been the reward system in medicine is, is, you know, up into a department or division chair or chief position. And that carries a lot of prestige. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's actually interesting to think about in the context, I think of leadership roles and are people stepping into leadership roles or, or not because um, shoot, I just lost my train of thought. That's okay. Give me a second. We'll (laughs) We'll have to edit this part. So Aaron, it sounds like there's a disconnect here. I think there is. And I think it it makes you wonder if there need to be um, parallel reward systems or parallel tracks um, for, you know, technical expertise and and leadership expertise uh, so that there are ways that you can promote and recognize people Mm -hmm. that speak to what they're truly excellent at. Um, and where their passion and purpose is so that they're not promoted into chair or chief or leadership positions that, 
you know, at the end of the day, they might not be successful at, or they it might make them pretty miserable because mm-hmm. maybe they were really, really happy as a researcher with their papers and and mentoring other researchers, right? Maybe that was where their purpose was mm-hmm. getting up every day. And now, you know, all of a sudden they've inherited a division or a department and there's so much administrative work to do on mm-hmm. top of patient care. Um, and they're still trying to keep their research agenda going and there's just not enough hours in the day. Um, and, and there's not enough hours of the day if not everything's bringing them joy. Right. Right. And that has such negative ripple effects. If that's a thing across, you know, the, the whole organization, when you have somebody who's now unhappy, you know, in his or her new leadership role, that's supposed to be so wonderful and prestigious. Um, thank you really for teasing that out. I want to ask you one, uh, uh, just a couple questions that really relate to communication. Um, you know, you've mentioned in, in the past that, you know, being a, a translator is necessary. And when we had a chance to talk about this, you know, it was really in the context of taking the complex and making it accessible and engaging and memorable for people who aren't necessarily at all familiar with what you're talking about and uh, the skill that really transcends profession. But we're talking about scientists and and medical professionals here. And I would love for you to share your your thoughts on that translator role and how you develop those translation skills. Yeah, that's a that's a great question and and such an important question. And I think of this sort of communication and translation piece a lot in in with respect to leadership mm-hmm. um, and skills leaders need as well. And I think fundamentally, you know, leaders need to be able to translate for their followers, whoever they are, right? Mm-hmm. And I think um, a lot of times physicians are are in the role of leading their patients, right? Medicine's mm-hmm. complex. Um, diagnoses are complex and they need to be, you know, translated and broken down and communicated to their patients. Um, and I think you need to be able to, you know, turn those concepts, those complex concepts into something your, your patients can understand and, and get their, their brain around. And, mm-hmm. and some, many physicians are quite skilled at this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think part of the reason that um, physicians are actually skilled at this is they're able to really listen to their patients and the questions that they're being asked. And I think hear the feelings and the fears behind mm-hmm. the questions. Mm-hmm. And that becomes part of the translation that needs to go on, right? Mm -hmm. Is how do you speak to what that patient is feeling with explaining a new diagnosis or explaining something that's going on? And I think a lot of physicians are very well trained in in doing that Mm -hmm. and in making that translation for their patient Mm -hmm. um, so that they understand and they can, you know, participate in shared decision-making about their care moving forward. Uh, it's just so important, and it's not something that's talked about that much. And I, so, you really made such a, a great distinction between you know, just breaking down the concepts and putting them into terms that the patient can understand. In the example that you just mentioned, but it's also infusing that explanation with emotion that's yeah. sort of picked up, and and that is just um, it's just wonderful. Thanks for highlighting that, Aaron. Um, as we wrap up, I, I wonder, you know, any recommendations? We've got listeners who are scientists, engineers, medical professionals, any any recommendations to listeners how they can maybe just do one thing after this episode to build their translation skills? You know, I think, um, Mark, picking back up on the, the sort of the emotion that's sort of underlying um, a lot of what happens in, in translation in, mm-hmm. in some ways is, you know, you need to listen to others so you know what to translate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I think listening and listening and listening again is really important mm-hmm. in translation, in listening to the questions and and then being curious and asking questions back so that you mm-hmm. can understand if if you don't already the emotion behind mm-hmm. the questions and where the questions are coming from. Um, because I think if you are able to address emotions and um some of the the feelings you can help people get to the next place and you can help people to understand. And I think we've seen a lot of that with the pandemic, right? There's been so much anxiety and uncertainty. And um, I think the major role of a lot of organizational leaders and healthcare leaders and national leaders um, 
has been around speaking to some of the the fear and the uncertainty and translating what's happening so people can understand. But you have to listen to know what emotions are there and and maybe do a little bit of digging with your curiosity to get to what's under the surface. So insightful, Erin. And those will be the last words on the episode. Just wonderful um, how you've really provided some specifics, some really great examples that people can relate to, and also just some expert guidance on how people can get from where they are, perhaps in the in, in their ability to communicate and get to that next level and be more effective in what they do every day. So thank you very much for being with us today. It was just wonderful to talk to you. Thanks for having me, Mark. And listeners, thank you for being with us on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. This is When Science Speaks a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world.